It is now our great pleasure to welcome our Connexus 2016 closing keynote speakers, the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair and Wap Canoe. On June 2nd, 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada released its historic report and included 94 recommendations to redress the legacy of the Indian residential school system. We've included that in your participant packages as well. And this advanced the process of reconciliation. Over 150 years, more than 150,000 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children were forcibly taken from their families and placed in residential schools, where they were often forbidden to speak their languages or practice their cultures. Unfortunately, many of these children were also subjected to abuse while in residential schools. The TRC commissioners travel from coast to coast to coast over the course of six years and listen to stories from more than 6,750 survivors and witnesses about their experience with the Indian residential school system, as well as the intergenerational trauma it had caused Aboriginal peoples in Canada. The goal of reconciliation is to forge and maintain respectful relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples to build a stronger, healthier, and more inclusive society. The Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair is the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He was Manitoba's first Aboriginal judge. He has been awarded a National Aboriginal Achievement Award in addition to many other awards and honors. Wap Canoe is one of a kind talent. He is the Associate Vice President for Indigenous Relations at the University of Winnipeg and an author having just published his memoir, The Reason You Walk. This book is also available for purchase and you can get his autograph after the session as well. Wab is a member of the Mdewin and is also an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Our, key, our, <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> our closing keynote is being moderated by Jessica Bolduc. Jessica is an Anishiwabekwe from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario from the Bachewana First Nation. She's the project co coordinator for the 4R Youth Movement. Those four R's are respect, reconciliation, reciprocity, and relevance. The movement was conceived as a collaboration of 14 national organiza organizations who are working with youth to rebuild Canada by creating opportunity for indigenous and non-indigenous young people to come together and through dialogue and learning, reconcile our relationship and support of a in support of a better future. Je vous prie maintenant d'accueillir l'honorable juge Murray Sinclair, Wab Canoe, Jessica Bolduc, Ainsi, qu Annie Saint ainsi que Annie Saint Smith George, aînée de la communauté. Now, please welcome Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair, Wab Canoe, and Jessica Bauduc, as well as Elder Annie Smith St. George. Hello everyone, welcome. Um, it's really great to be back here on unceded Algonquin territory and I couldn't think of anyone better than to welcome us to this area than Algonquin elder, daughter of a trapper from the Kitagon ZB First Nation, Elder Annie Smith St. George. Quickly. Any Smith St. George Kishkwan according to the cause. Makwa would do them. I'm Annie Smith St. George, and I was born and raised in Kitagon ZB, Algonquin First Nation. Welcome you all. The ones who have traveled the great distance to come to the territory, the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation, the land of my ancestors. I am happy to be here honored to be here to open to actually open and close this gathering ça fait plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui pour vous accueillir sur notre grand territoire des algonquins no city comment faire comment on va expliquer aujourd'hui as we're going to talk about today 
reconciliation. Reconciliation is a big word. Reconciliation, the damage that has been done to the Aboriginal people over hundreds of years with residential school, but otherwise as well. We're looking at post-traumatic stress syndrome, generational impact. We're looking at high rates of suicide among our youth to this day. We're, we're, last week I came and now we're looking we're into an inquiry for our missing young murdered women. And it goes on. <laughs> and a lot of them are in prison. A lot of our youth are packed in prisons. So dans les prisons présentement, même dans la région de Québec, ils voulaient construire une prison pour les autochtones. Imaginez-vous. Wow. To build a jail for Aboriginal people. How do you like that? I questioned. You know, our people, the youth, have to have, we have to be empowered. There's many of us that moved on. Many are resilient. Many has got knocked down like myself. And many has got up and walked forward with our heads up. And I worked in employment too as, a, as an employee. And there is still, when I was working and referring Aboriginal people in a line of work that I did, I encountered a lot of racism back then. And I don't think it has still changed. We got to look. We got to work together. Reconciliation is a, not only one person, one government. When we look at re reconciliation, I think we're going to have to work together. And it's everybody's duty. Our people. We, at the beginning of time, when the first Europeans and settlers came, we opened our doors. Nous avons accueilli les premiers qui sont arrivés sur ce territoire. We, we fed you. We helped you. We nourished you. We healed you with our medicines. This is who we are. And now we are a broken nation. When people lose their language. What the residential schools did was kill the Indian in us. Not only residential schools, regular schools as well. We lose our language, we are nobody. When you lose your language, you lose your culture, you lose your identity, you lose everything. You are nobody. I know. I was discriminated upon many, many, many times in my life. I was broken many times in my life. I fell many times in my life. And I stood up and I got up and I crawled many times in my life. But I am here, still going, walking, still looking towards helping our young people to get empowered and to be proud of who they are. What makes me happy and what made me happy was a couple of weeks ago at the NAC, I lost my talk with the orchestras, gathered together youth from, from all coast to coast, and they made, they made their own songs. It's on the YouTube there now. I was so proud when they came on stage and the way they looked at me, and the way they smiled, and the way they performed, that was an accomplishment. That's a start. That's a new beginning, a new step forward, baby step forward. When we are looking, working here together, we're all together. Nous sommes ici ensemble. De travailler, d'encourager les femmes, d'encourager les hommes, et d'encourager nos jeunes d'avancer, d'ouvrir les portes, 
de regarder des, des opportunités d'emploi. Parce que si vous ne travaillez pas, si vous n'êtes pas capable de travailler, c'est très difficile de remonter la côte et de guérir et de marcher fier comme nos ancêtres il était. And in closing, I, it is our culture to always thank the Creator for who we are. We are here together. What a great gift. I acknowledge and I thank the Creator for everything He has given us this day. Robert. I thank the Creator for all of us being here today. For all of us are so unique. For all of us, we are so individual. Every one of us is a precious. We are precious. We carry the precious, what the Creator has given us, what great gifts He's given us. He's given us hard walks. He's given hard travels. He's given us hard teachings. But that makes us unique, beautiful. We are beautiful, and each one of us alone here in this room we are so beautiful because we are we are from the creator we are part of a key one miigwech have a nice back nice uh, uh remaining day and have safe travels home and in our language i always say we will greet again miigwech i was honored to be here miigwech merci So Chimi Gwech, um, to our elder Annie, and um, I'm really, really honored to be here and to literally be surrounded by great, powerful, amazing Anishinaabe men. And my name is Jessica, and I am from um, a little community in northern Ontario called Sault Ste. Marie. Anyone, anyone know the Sioux? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So it's really great to be back here in this area and um, to be joining in a conversation today about reconciliation in Canada and what we can learn from the, ba the past to build a future together. So I'm here joined by Justice Sinclair and Wab Canoe and we're going to have a little bit of a conversation and we're going to start out by talking amongst ourselves with some questions that I've prepared. Um, and then we're going to open it up to the audience and bring you into that conversation. So maybe we can just try that out with um, a test question. And that would be, when you were growing up, gentlemen, what did you want to be? <laughs> I think there's an assumption in that question, and that is that we're grown up. I'm not entirely convinced I'm finished yet. First of all, I want to apologize to all the young women in the room who came rushing up to see me and all got in the way over here. I hate traveling with him because he's always doing that. He's always interfering with my fan club who want to come and see me. And, uh, and then he insists on taking selfies with all of you. I'm sure that it's embarrassing to you, so I apologize for that. Uh, it, when I think about what it is that I thought about at the time that I was younger, 
uh, in, in thinking about what I wanted to be. I, I think a lot about the fact that there were so many people who stood in the way of my thoughts, who stood in the way of my wishes. Because um, in preparing my th thoughts for this morning, I uh, was recalling an event that occurred to me back when I was in high school, just starting high school in grade nine, and uh, they required all of us to take what they called then an aptitude test. Do they still do that? Aptitude testing? I don't know. Uh, they do, eh? Some people are nodding. Uh, well, aptitude testing at that time may not be as advanced as it is today, but uh, at that time when I took that aptitude test, it was about your preferences and your experience and your family's experience, among other things. And uh, when I, when I took it, I scored very high on uh, work related to people. So my guidance counselor in high school said, you scored very high on this range of skills or desires to work with people. Uh, she said, but we think that you should go to Red River College and study to be a carpenter or a mechanic because that's what your family has always done. And we think that probably going to university will be too challenging for you and you should probably not think about that. And so they tried to stream me into what they called the occupational entrance program in high school at that time. And uh, they had two streams. One was the occupational entrance, the other was the university entrance stream. And I wanted to go into the university entrance scheme because I wanted to go into university. Uh, but, uh, and I wanted to be a teacher. That was my initial thought. There's reasons why that never panned out that I could share with you at some point. But um, I, I wanted to go into the university stream and they said I couldn't do that unless I got my guardian's permission. I was being raised by my grandmother. So I had to get my guardian's permission in order to go into university entrance. Nobody else did in our class except they wanted me to get permission. And uh, so I had to go and talk to my grandmother about going into university. And of course, there were costs associated with that that she acknowledged we'd have to think about. Um, but there was also a concern on her part because she had been raised in a residential school in um, Fort Alexander, which was a Catholic residential school. And as a condition of her leaving, she, she was permitted to marry my grandfather on condition that all of her children had to become Catholic, and all of her grandchildren had to be Catholic. And one of them had to be dedicated to the church. And I was the one who was dedicated to the church. I know, it's hard to believe. But, but I, she had decided early on in my life that I would become a priest. And so she said to me, when I asked her if I could go to the university entrance program, she said to me that she wanted me to be, become a priest, and so she hesitated to sign the form. And uh, it was only on the very last day when the form had to be submitted that I managed to convince her to let me go into university. And uh, she said, well, in order for that to happen, you have to promise me one thing, and that is that you will do something with that education. And so my commitment to her was that I would. And I said initially I was going to become a teacher because my, I had two aunts who were teachers. And uh, so I thought that was a, a good lead into university. As it turned out, I found I didn't like kids. <laughs> and so becoming a judge who locks them up seemed to be a little more appealing. Well, that's not entirely true. I, I, had, uh, I had a change of heart when I was in university and, uh, and eventually went into law school. But at the earliest point in time at which I could actually think about a job that I wanted to be was I wanted to be a police officer when I was young because it was on television. Well, actually, when I was in grade two, I do remember wanting to be a cowboy, but... Uh, I don't know that that was really a career ambition as much as it was to be in the movies and to be a rock, and to be a rock star like Wob and to be a TV star. But it was about 
becoming something. But one of the other things that stood in the way of my ambitions was that there were no people from my community who were modeling that kind of thing. So there were no people uh, after whom I could um, follow who had kind of broken the way. And I have spent most of my career, in fact, probably breaking down doors and and um, creating new trails for other people to follow behind me. But I think that's necessary. People need to do that. And sometimes in order to do that, you have to um, be a little more forceful than those who come behind you have to be. And, and the other thing I want to say is that um, I've now in, in my later years, as I'm an older kid, I have come to recognize that uh, our education stream and our thinking stream as young people calls for us to really think about and be able to answer four questions for ourselves. And one of them is, where do I come from? And that, that's a personal history question. I need to know where I come from. I need to know my history. And I need to know our people's history. And where do I go or where am I going after I leave this earth? Uh, it's about faith and it's about... Uh, spiritual beliefs and also the third question is why am I here what's my purpose in life and that's connected to careers connected to work and connected to how you behave and how you treat people and the fourth question is is really who am I and the part of the problem that I was experiencing throughout my life and many indigenous youth today even, are experiencing, is that there's no easy way for us to find the answers to those questions in the school systems in which we're placed. It's a little more easier now than it used to be, but when I went to school, we were never taught our history. We never were made aware of who our heroes were and what they did. We never understood what our culture was about and what our basic beliefs were all about. And we didn't know what our meaning of life was. We never received those teachings because they were denied to us. And so growing up without those answers means that to a certain extent you were um, fishing around to find something to do that would be consistent with what you wanted to be. And so that's why for a while in my life I kind of wandered from one career ambition to another that uh, I wasn't quite sure what my purpose was. And while I think all young people go through that stage, for us it was more difficult because there were no people to whom we could turn to answer those questions. So it was only in my later years, when I was um, in my 20s, that I decided law school was where I wanted to go. But I didn't go to law school to become a lawyer. Now that's the other crazy thing. I went to law school to get into politics because I wanted to create change. I wanted to do something, as my grandmother had ordered me to do, I wanted to do something with that knowledge and that education. I wanted to improve things. And I thought getting into politics was the best way of doing that. But as you've seen, I didn't do that. Although I keep telling my wife, as soon as this legal gig is over, I'm going into politics. But, and she says, over your dead body. <laughs> so uh, that's probably not going to happen. But nonetheless, um, my career thoughts have changed over the years and, and the processes have differed. But a lot of it was accompanied by confusion because we never had the answers to those four big questions until I never had them, at least until very late in life. So that's my story. That was a great way to open up that conversation. Wob, is there any stories or moments that come to mind for you around um, growing up in Northern Ontario and, and coming through sort of some choices around what you would want to be when you grow up or where you've, you've come to now? Well, it was, uh, it was much more of a straight line because from a young age I realized I wanted to be an author, rapper, university administrator, broadcast journalist. Of course, of course. <laughs> 
So at the Enigaming, at the Enigaming daycare, they used to give me strange looks when I said that. <laughs> I just want to say briefly, Obanakwit and Nigo, Piju and Totem. Apachinji Ken Dam Pijaya no ma Anishinaabe ga abi wat kitiganzi bing a king. Nimi got to weag minwa away kichi aya a ga anama eh on ma ogi da king. And uh, I'm very grateful for the prayer and the acknowledge the uh, territory of the Algonquin people. That language is uh, Anishinaabe Mwen, and it is the was the lingua franca for the part of the world now called Canada from the St. Lawrence to the Red River, right? And so if you came here for the first 200 years following contact, you didn't need to know French or English, you needed to know an indigenous language, right? And yet how many of us heard that language or learned that language going into the uh, school system in this country, though it is a huge part of our collective heritage and our collective history? So I think it's another example of uh, some of the issues that Murray uh, is getting at. You know, um, the book that I wrote it really is a reflection in some ways on the difference between my father's generation's experience and my generation's experience in this country. And although the oppression is much less overt and much less severe, there are still challenges that remain. But I had a, a chance to really reflect on this, uh, I think, about two months ago. I went to St. Francis Xavier University in uh, Antigonish, uh, Nova Scotia, where um, my father went to school in the 60s. And in a very kind of uh, kind act of reconciliation, the people from the Cody Institute presented me with his diploma that he was awarded in 1965, I think. It said his government name, his residential school name, Peter Kelly, on it. But then they issued a new piece of parchment, and on it they gave his birth name, his Anishinaabe name, Tabasanaquit, Kenu. And uh, it was very meaningful for me to go there and to see that this institution had um, committed to reconciliation with a gesture like that. But how it relates to careers is that they also gave me his student file. And in the student file uh, were all the letters between the Regional Director General of Indian Affairs and the Registrar of uh, St. Francis Xavier University. And it was amazing to see like the people from Indian Affairs talking about my father, his brothers, his sister, his mom, everyone in the community sharing the personality profiles, the analyses that they carried out on their career prospects, and just to get, gain an idea of like the complete and utter domination that the federal government uh, subjected our people to at the time, right? And so for you know, the generation before mine and my family, it was a political, it was an act of political lobbying just to be considered to continue your education past grade eight, right? And it's a remarkable, remarkable feat that they were able to uh, clear that space and to go through uh, that process and eventually, you know, achieve uh, some manner of education. My father got the uh, social development diploma from Cody. Uh, my late uncle John, um, one of the first uh, Anishinaabe guys to get a master's degree in, uh, you know, our part of the country. Uh, my uncle Fred, you know, was a distinguished, uh, you know, writer and speaker, and so they're all very smart, and yet uh, very clear barriers that they face in order to um, build careers. And so the careers that they did choose, for the most part, were around fighting for civil liberties, civil rights, and um, freedom for indigenous people, right? And they did that because that was the path that was open to them. And uh, now it's different. You know, I just came from a meeting with the justice minister. The justice minister in this country is now a Klekwekwek woman. You know, she's an indigenous woman from Vancouver Island initially. And so there's a much different, you know, um, career path open to indigenous people uh, in this country uh, today. But when I was growing up, I used to like hear from my dad, you know, I really hope that you don't uh, spend your life trying to fight for freedom for indigenous people. Because like, it would be an indication that I have failed in my mission if you have to spend your life doing that. And uh, I didn't really understand what he meant by it at the time. But as I got a little bit older, like as a teenager, uh, I you know, did feel the calling because I did see the you know, situation that my reserve was in and uh, some of my friends living in Winnipeg were in. 
And, it, and I know that there are still systemic and structural inequities in, in this country, some of which are baked into our constitution. And so I did feel the calling to, um, you know, try and work in our community and uh, try and do things to help uh, ameliorate the situation for young Indigenous people. And now having, um, you know, spent a bit of time doing that, though certainly not as much as, you know, others uh, on stage here, um, I do recognize what my father was saying. Because to answer your initial question, like, what, what, what did I want to be as a kid? Well, like, first I wanted to be an NHL player. And it's the greatest legacy of the, you know, greatest damage of the residential school era that I was never able to make it to the NHL. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, but, but then after that, like, I wanted to, I thought, like, physics would be pretty cool. I'd like to be a nuclear physicist, right? And, um... I got to go to Triumph, our National Particle Accelerator, a couple weeks ago, so that was pretty cool. But uh, that there still is a pressure on, you know, young achievers in our community to devote themselves to settling the basic questions of human rights and human decency for Indigenous people, rather than just pursuing their own career paths, is, I think, a form of uh, a barrier that some Indigenous people still face in this country. Because you talk to the bright people in our communities, what do they want to be? For the most part, they want to be lawyers and politicians. Part of that is because those are the high income earners that they know, but part of it is also because they recognize the inequity that they faced growing up, and they recognize the inequity that people like them continue to face. And so they feel compelled to work in fields where they think they'll be able to make a difference. But I think we'll really know, like over and above having socioeconomic indicators uh, to let us know how we're doing on reconciliation, you know, reconciliation will mean pay is the same, income is the same, employment levels are the same, educational outcomes are the same. I think we'll also know that re reconciliation has uh, been achieved in this country when First Nations and Métis and Inuit kids no longer feel that they have to be social justice warriors simply because of where they grew up and where they started out in life. And so that's... <clears throat> And uh, so that's, you know, um, maybe a little less uh, clear-cut measure, but I think it is a measure to keep in mind. And so every time you're counseling a young person who feels that they have to change the system just in order for a kid like them to have a fair shot at life, that's probably a reminder that we have a ways to go yet in terms of this project of reconciliation. And so I, I do think there is a lot of transformation taking place, and I do think the educational sector is really doing a lot of that work and I am very kind of proud of the work we're doing at U of W and our colleagues at Lakehead in rolling out indigenous course requirements so that every undergraduate at our institutions will learn about First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples while they're there. I'm very proud of uh, school districts like Abbotsford, North Van, um, Greater Victoria, who are making it very easy for teachers to incorporate indigenous knowledge into their class classes. Um, for, you know, the Northwest Territories with the Dene Kede curriculum, um, the uh, Inuit curriculum, for the province of Alberta for committing to make residential schools a mandatory part of K-12, and all these other initiatives across the country that are taking place. I do think that that is a positive, positive uh, outcome, because not only will it help lay the foundation for young Indigenous people to grow up in a society where they are more included and therefore less likely to feel that they have to change the world just in order for a kid like them to succeed. But also, I think that there's benefits on the big picture side of the equation. Namely, that I think indigenizing their curriculum gives Canadians a more authentic picture of ourselves. Again, returning to the language that I spoke at the beginning, which is a huge part of this nation's history and yet very few people in this room never mind speaking, probably have even heard very much of it before, right? Well, other than Ottawa, right? That's an Anishinaabe word, but, uh, you know, it's a little aside. But also, I think it can drive an innovation agenda. I think, you know, innovation is the greatest um, creator of value in a knowledge economy. And so if we want young people to innovate, why would we teach them all to think the same way? Mm -hmm. So it seems to me if we are going to teach young people to think different, then some of those alternative ways of seeing the world uh, should come from 
the indigenous worldviews that are right here. And so, yeah, kids in southern Ontario should learn about Haudenosaunee worldviews and Anishinaabe worldviews. Kids on Vancouver Island should learn about Kwakwakwiuk and Nuchano worldviews. Kids in the north should learn about Dene and Inuit uh, methodologies and cosmologies. So I'm optimistic. I think we are in a very unique historic moment, thanks in large part to the amazing work of um, Murray and also of the residential school survivors and of uh, Phil Fontaine. And uh, now this project of reconciliation is uh, in most of our hands, you know. Um, I say most because, I mean, he's already done more than his fair share of the work, so I think, you know, we could give him a pass on some of this reconciliation stuff now, and maybe uh, the rest of us in the room can take up some of that slack. Thanks, Bob. Um, that, that's a really good segue into the next question that I'd like to ask Justice Sinclair, which is really about your work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and in particular, the TRC's call to action number seven, which talks about inequalities between non Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people when it comes to employment and education. Did you want to talk a little bit about that call to action um, and how it relates to the context of this conference here? One of the um, <clears throat> important uh, pieces of information that we all need to be aware of is the huge economic gap that exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in this country, uh, largely because of uh, inadequate access to education and even once that, uh, education is achieved, the failure of the education system to retain Indigenous children. That partly has to do with the content of curriculum and teaching methods and kind of focus upon issues that are alienating to indigenous children. Uh, and, and so the, the, the fact that the educational system is failing our children means that their dropout rates are still extraordinarily high. And as a result of that, the, uh, the success rate at school uh, and the completion rate uh, in, in sc the public school system and in the First Nations school system is relatively uh, low, it's much lower than it should be, it could be much higher. With that lack of education, the ability to enter into the workforce, the ability to advance through the workforce and to be selective about the kind of career choices you make are going to be challenged and, and uh, challenging. And so uh, that's creating a, um, a gap in the economy f between indigenous and non-indigenous people that is narrowing slightly and has narrowed in the last 20 years, but it's still quite significant. So the, um, the average income being earned by indigenous people in this country is still far less than the average income for non-indigenous people in this country. Uh, even taking into account the fact that uh, the most of the uh, people who are coming here, the newcomers who are coming into this country are occupying those lower income paying jobs, uh, but nonetheless, the unemployment rate is still so high in First Nations communities that the government of Canada doesn't even measure it anymore. They don't even bother taking account of it. When they issue their unemployment statistics on a monthly basis, they don't even count the unemployed or the people who have abandoned job searching because there are no jobs in the area where they live. Um, so as a result of that, the economic gap between indigenous and non-indigenous people is uh, still quite stark, considering that this is 2016 and that uh, education is supposed to have allowed us to advance um, to a greater position of equality over the years, uh, which will encourage people to stay in school and encourage people to go to university or to develop careers or be able to get into the workforce and that's not happening. In addition to that, I think the work environment still needs to be addressed. Uh, uh, the employment situation for many indigenous people is, uh, lacks attraction. They can't get into uh, some of the positions because um, uh, recruitment and acceptance of applications for people to, to work generally requires some kind of experience. It's hard to get experience in some of the communities that people are coming from. And so unemployment rates, even among those who are qualified to work, are still 
um, exceptionally high just from the, the data that we're looking at. So as a result of that, uh, we need to recognize that there is a requirement for us as a society to do something about that, to take notice of it and to work with it and to do something with it as much as possible. Um, if, the, if the gap were narrowed more, then the social costs of for supporting indigenous communities on the part of government would be dramatically reduced. We have a study that was done for the TRC looking at our calls to action, for example, which suggests that in one year, if the unemployment, uh, if the income level was matched between indigenous and non-indigenous people um, to, to earn the same income, the uh, social benefits, or the cost benefit to Canada would be $7 billion. So that means that the amount of money that Indigenous people will be putting back into the economy would be in the area of $7 billion. And in addition to that, the costs of the government supporting families, so the social welfare costs, would be reduced significantly by as much as 3 to $4 billion. And so the potential saving to Canada by narrowing just the income gap would be in the area of $12 billion per year. And and so as a result, we, we really do need to think about the way that, uh, that we are conducting our economic activities in this country to ensure that more opportunities are made available to Indigenous people from an educational perspective that will allow them to advance into those careers. And that also includes making sure that once they do make those career decisions, that we are creating work environments that retain the employed Indigenous person because sometimes the work environment is hostile and it's difficult for people to want to stay in an employment situation or in a job when there is such uh, hostility and racism in the workplace and that needs to be addressed. And that also calls for the fact that sometimes employment requires families to be moved from distant locations into urban areas or more uh, geographically distant places and that creates some social challenges as well for families. So those factors need to be taken into account in how we are going to do business in this country and, and we need to change our thinking about it. But ultimately, if we do narrow just the income gap, never mind the employment and uh, other social uh, welfare issues, if we just narrowed that income gap to make it more equal, then we would reduce the amount of uh, cost to society for having such a large population of Indigenous people who are um, not able to make a successful or significant contribution to the economy. If any of you were following the news yesterday, then you will have heard that the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal um, ruled that the federal government discriminates against First Nations people, specifically First Nations children on reserve, by failing to provide the same level of child welfare services that, assist, that exist in other communities. Sydney Blackstock, the executive director of the First Nations and Family Caring Society, is quoted as saying, the best economic stimulus you can have is investing in a child. Wab, can you speak to the significance of this ruling and the future of Indigenous people in Canada? Um, and feel free to, to pick up from what uh, Justice Sinclair was speaking about in terms of the inequality um, and narrowing that gap as well. Sure, well, we were, we were talking about this yesterday, so basically I'm just going to parrot everything that he told me what to think about this <laughs> ruling. So you're getting the watered-down version of Murray's answer to this question. Here. No, I think it's a, it's a huge moral victory. Um, you know, that this woman, Cindy Blackstock, uh, successfully proved that the federal government is discriminating against First Nations kids, something that we all know intuitively in our community, but she was able to, you know, lay down the evidence to prove it in front of this tribunal. Um, so it's a large moral victory. And, uh, you know, the piece that I wouldn't borrow from what Murray was talking about yesterday is that this has implications for other sectors too. So we know that education on reserve is underfunded uh, by about $4,000 per student per year 
That's a national average, okay? So a school of 300 students, right? You're talking about what? Like $1.2 million less per year for the operations of that school than a provincial school would get. So that's like way less uh, teachers, EAs, all the educational activities that make school fun, you know? So we're talking about young people in this country who have the most socioeconomic barriers, um, are often faced with the, the most dysfunctional environments. We're demanding that they step up and be the workforce of tomorrow, and yet we're providing them with the least amount of educational funding of any group in this country. So explain to me again how the reconciliation process is gonna work. Well, it's probably gonna work by one, addressing the inequities that exist there, and then two, starting to get creative about how we deliver education on reserve. Um, there's health inequities there too, but to build on what Murray was just saying about closing the income gap, the income gap's about $10,000 um, between median incomes in the indigenous community and then the national average. So to close that gap, like, I mean, you really would need some sort of massive stimulus project, right? Some sort of huge infrastructure um, spending program undertaken by the federal government. It's probably the only way that a government can carry out an intervention um, in a community and actually, you know, uh, put money into people's pockets. Well, potentially there, that is on the horizon, right? Because the federal government is talking about making a, a large infrastructure play. But uh, the relevance to the tribunal is if the logic of that decision carries out over to other fields, then potentially the federal government should take a look at whether they are funding infrastructure projects on reserve to the same extent that they do off reserve. And I would suspect uh, that they're not because um, one, the scope of projects is often different rather than getting bridges and highways built, we get like a powwow grounds or like a community center built on reserve. Um, and we like powwow grounds and community centers, <laughs> but we could use, you know, water infrastructure and bridges and, you know, paved roads, unless you're in six nay, in which case you have, uh, in which case you have paved roads. I'm playing to the uh, six nay delegates here. <laughs> so I think that uh, we, we should look at that. And, you know, I mean, people in this country seem to think that we're going to get somewhere just by shouting at the problem rather than trying to do things differently. Right, like you even saw it with some of the commentary about this thing yesterday. It's like, 10 year battle, this woman's been the subject of government surveillance, you know, she's been attacked by right wing uh, voices in this country. She scores a huge victory where they say, yep, there is discrimination in the form of unequal funding. What do the right wing people say right away? Yeah, well, of course we were discriminating in the form of uh, not paying enough money, but you know, money alone won't solve the problem. And it's the same thing they said about First Nations education, right? Like, hey, you're discriminating against these kids by underfunding their education by the tune of $4,000 per full-time equivalent student per year. Yeah, of course, but you know, money won't solve that problem. Right? Well, how about we try? Well, like, why wouldn't we do the first thing and give the kids the same shot as everyone else? Because the only way you can say that money won't solve the problem is if you have spent the money and it didn't solve the problem. Right? So that would be a novel approach, completely revolutionary <laughs> in Canadian history. Totally innovative. Completely innovative. Uh, people would never suspect, you know, in this country. So I, I do think that uh, this uh, decision is a turning point, um, but perhaps more on the level of symbolism, you know, because I do think that, you know, while it will have very tangible impact on the way child welfare services are funded going forward for First Nations agencies and, you know, for kids on reserve, that because there is uh, a critical mass of Indigenous allies and Indigenous people in the new government, that it could have reverberations outside of just merely the child welfare system and will hopefully impact the way education, health, social services, and potentially even infrastructure programs are delivered uh, on First Nations. And again, if we want reconciliation to occur, then closing those gaps should be a foundational step towards anything else that we do. Because you know, we like, how are we going to talk about like, we're going to have like the very like spiritual high level dialogue of reconciliation while like my little brothers and sisters on the reserve are still like you know, 
living in third world c conditions? No, I don't think so. Like, I think we should have everyone living in, you know, the same similar quality of life. And then, you know, we can engage in the high level, you know, spiritually fulfilling, self-actualizing, self-realizing dialogue of reconciliation. So before I open up And that's exactly what I told them yesterday. <laughs> Verbatim. <laughs> Verbatim. <laughs> Good memory. This entire conversation has been scripted. Um, before I open up questions to the audience, I'm just going to give you a cue um, that if you have some, start thinking of them. I wanted to, um, to speak a little bit about the TRC's um, approach to describing reconciliation, and that is in that it's about respectful relationships. Um, Justice Sinclair, do you, could, could you comment on that with respect to uh, the relationship that you see is needed for this new government? And, and what does that look like in terms of a respectful relationship between Indigenous and, and non-Indigenous people? Changing the relationship with, uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in this country is a long, difficult process. And, uh, w when we held our last national, event in, in, uh, last national event in Edmonton in March of 14, uh, my closing remarks, I said, if you thought getting to the truth was hard, getting to reconciliation is going to be even harder. Uh, because people kind of thought, well, now that we've finished the statement taking, then it's just a piece of cake. We're all going to be huggy and happy and we're going to move forward together. And that's not true because now that you have uh, awoken the beast, so to speak, and that is that young indigenous people and their parents and grandparents have all um, become aware of the validation of their thoughts and their thinking and their uh, wishes about things. Uh, now the demands for fairer treatment, for better treatment, for more equitable treatment, and for a process of reconciliation that uh, can be equated to a more just relationship are going to become clearer. And that's going to be very challenging for the non-Indigenous population. And partly it's, it's not just because the demands are going to increase, it's because Canadians have allowed themselves to be lulled into a false sense of security when it comes to Indigenous people, largely because the public education system has failed you. Public education system not only taught Indigenous kids while they were in the schools, the same thing they taught them in residential schools, and that is that Indigenous people were inferior, they had no relevance to the history of this country, that they weren't civilized, they weren't uh, people who were worthy of special consideration that their Aboriginal rights, their Indigenous rights, their rights over the territory were less than our rights and therefore uh, they didn't need to be protected and they don't need to be receiving special consideration and that uh, our rights as colonizers, and they don't use that term of course, settlers, people coming to this who have a to this land who have a better idea for how the land can be used and the resources can be developed, that they should be given primary consideration over things and in areas of conflict that it should be the developers that win out all the time. That kind of thinking uh, comes out of the way that schools have treated indigenous people uh, all the time and as a result People in positions of leadership, not only in government, but also in the business community and in society at large, the movers and thinkers of non-Indigenous Canada, tend to believe that Indigenous people have no validity. And it's that thinking that is going to be most severely challenged because now Indigenous kids, young Indigenous leaders, uh, and uh, with the support of their elders are now standing up and saying, look what you have done to us, we're not going to take it anymore, and now you have something to account for because we demand a relationship which respects us because we are valid. So that relationship of uh, respect is a relationship of respect which is going to be grudgingly given and is going to be hard fought over because when people who uh, have been 
in a, in a victimized situation suddenly stand up and fight back. The victimizer, reluctant, reluctantly might admit that they have done wrong, but still have a hard time changing their behavior. And if you think about that in the context of a family violence situation, you know, you have an abusive husband who suddenly has been charged with an offense and has to account for the fact that he's now looking at a potential jail sentence. They're the first people to apologize, and they apologize profusely. They apologize right up until you sentence them. And th whether their apologies are sincere or not, they're... The result of those apologies often is that the other party to the relationship wants to continue the relationship afterwards. And I can't tell you how, as a judge, I often have the victim of the husband's violence coming to court in support of the husband asking me not to send him to jail because they want to protect the family. They want to take care of the children. They want to make sure the children have a, a good environment. And yet, you know in your heart of hearts it's going to be hard for this abuser to change his ways unless something is done to ensure that he changes his ways. And that's the very same situation in Canada when it comes to the way that indigenous and non-indigenous people have be behaved towards each other. The victims are now standing up and saying, we're not going to take it anymore, but we're not going to try to send you back to Europe. We can't too many of you, and it's far too complicated, you know, where <laughs> we won't be able to find enough boats, and we're not sure that Europe but wants that. you anyway. So, <laughs> so, so it's, it's just not in the cards, and we have to have some kind of relationship with you, so let's figure out what that relationship's going to be like. And if we are going to have a relationship with you, it's a relationship in which you must respect us. You must accept the fact that we, as a people, are valid people, that we have a valid way of believing, of thinking, our language is valid, our history is valid, and you have to begin to allow us to teach that not only to our children, but to your children as well, because future generations, in order to be able to get along together, have to grow up in that mutually respectful way so that they stop behaving badly towards each other because of how the school teaches them. And so reconciliation is going to be hard to achieve. And the hardest part of achieving reconciliation is for the power holders, the ones in that position of victimizing, who, who come from that community, who are not even aware that they are victimizing, who are not even aware that they are in that position of, of uh, controlling trying to control or believing that they should be able to control the lives of indigenous people who are, because they're not even aware of that fact, becoming aware of it or being told that they're doing it is a very difficult conversation. And so reconciliation is going to take a long time. It took 125 years simply to get an apology about residential schools. It may take that period of time in order for us to get to a point where we can say we have a mutually respectful relationship. But it's going to occur only because every single day those battles for reconciliation and mutual respect are fought and are won. And that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. And even with this government, and I have a lot of respect for this government and the people who are in it, even with their commitment to reconciliation and changing the relationship. Uh, we have to recognize that a government only can do so much, that it really is up to the people in the country to want to be in a relationship of mutual respect. It's not up to the, just the leaders. As Wab was saying, that very high level discussion between the leaders is one thing, but at the end of the day, it's the people who live on the other side of the fence from each other who have to be able to get along, whose children may not get along, and it's how they resolve that conflict that's going to determine what kind of society we have in the future. And that's why reconciliation 
is a one-to-one -one friendship question. And it doesn't mean we have to be huggy buddies, but it does mean we have to be respectful of each other and we have to be prepared to acknowledge the validity of each other's existence. And that goes both ways. From the Aboriginal perspective, it's not about send them back to where they came from. And from a non-Indigenous perspective, it's not about shut up, stop whining, and get out of my way. It's about acknowledging each other, accepting the validity of each other, and now we have to figure out how we are going to get along here. So what kind of a marriage are we going to have going forward? So that's the conversation we're going to have. And that's a difficult conversation. Thank you. Can I ask that um, the Connexus team, is there any questions that are coming in through the app or through Twitter that we can bring up? Oh, perfect. Thank you, Bruce. And so as I'm uh, asking these questions, I'll maybe get those of you in the audience who are thinking of something to start to make your way up to the mics. We've got a few mics throughout the audience there and um, I'll, I'll be sure to, to get you in the queue. So question, question from Twitter. What is the best indicator leading to high school success? Employment, measures of hope and optimism, graduation rate. What is the best indicator leading to high school success? Is it one of those three? Okay, employment, measures of hope and optimism, graduation rate, maybe I just need to read it differently. Different intonation. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll work together on this question. Um, is, is anything bubbling up for either of you around that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, want, we want every young person in this country to have a good job and to have a meaningful career. But personally, and maybe it's because I work at a liberal arts school, but I would want something more than just a job for young people in this country. I would also like for them to be able to answer the big questions in life that Murray is talking about. And when you grow up in a community with a high rate of suicide and you're asking yourself, what am I doing here? If you can answer that with, well, I'm a janitor or I work at the store or I uh, work on the highway, that may not be the most meaningful answer, but at least it's a start. And so jobs are important. Career path is very important. But I would ho hope also that in high school or college or university, we are also helping to create good citizens. Right? And so, you know, when I think back to my undergraduate education, um, some of the most important courses I took were philosophy courses. The job market for philosophers peaked approximately 2,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so it would probably fail by most of those measures, you know, in terms of uh, employment. I guess maybe measures of hope and optimism uh, it would do well by. But, you know, in, in those courses I learned how to write. I learned how to, you know, think critically. I learned about logic. I learned how to deconstruct arguments. And I use all of those things in uh, the workplace every single day. Um, because you don't get mandatory indigenous learning across a mainstream institution without being able to out-argue people who are very smart, very educated, and very determined to stop change in uh, relatively conservative settings, right? So those things have been very valuable for me. So I would hope that we recognize that. And while we do need to have people in the trades, and we do need high school completion, and we do want university credentials, we, we should also recognize that that's not the whole picture of education. We also have to furnish people with a inspiration, with uh, some sort of um, resilience. Because uh, when I talk to employers too, like one of the big telecom operators, I was talking to an H HR guy there, and I was like, what are you looking for? And I was expecting him to say like, oh, we want you know, MBAs or we want you know, electrical engineers. And he said, you know, I don't really care so much about the credential. What I, want somebody is, what I want from someone is someone who can learn quickly, who can adapt, and someone who's resilient. You know, I don't care if I have to train this person up to the, the standard of uh, their position, as long as they're able to adapt quickly and that they're gonna be an innovative, contributing member to the team, right? And so I think that uh, often 
the discussion around education in this country is kind of too focused on credential or is too focused on strict indicators. We do need indicators, you know, we do need to measure, we need to report, and we need to commit to closing gaps, and we need to commit to improving uh, certain indicators, but we have to remind ourselves that that's not the whole story, right? You know, like uh, productivity, for instance. Is it a good thing if productivity goes up in our economy? Yes. Should that be the only consideration? Well, the most productive workplace you can imagine is a sweatshop. How many people here want to work in that environment? Probably none of us, right? So again, we have to be smart. We have to use big data. We have to incorporate that into our thinking, but we have to think a little bit more broadly and I think a little bit more creatively. And uh, I am a firm believer in liberal arts education. To me, the best form of education is something that is wide and expansive, like a liberal arts philosophy, you know, humanities type education, rounded off with something more concrete, like say a professional degree or a trade or you know, some uh, sort of practical internship. So I would hope that we uh, make sure that every young person in this country can go as far down that path towards getting those kind of two streams of education, whether they come from an indigenous perspective or a mainstream perspective as possible, and that they're, as a result, uh, able to kind of really reach their full potential. In five seconds, I can tell you, I think, I work with judges, I have to, uh, recognize they have a limited attention span. So uh, the keys to success are three things. One is a good foundation, the other is ambition, and the third is opportunity. And those are the things that every person needs in life in order to be successful. So a good foundation, ambition, and opportunity. And if you're looking at what it is that you can do to help your um, clients, your students, the people you're working with, ensure that they have a good foundation, ensure that their ambition is strong and they know what it is they want to achieve and how to achieve it, and that um, they know where the opportunities lie and know how to take advantage of opportunities. That's more than five seconds, but you're not judges. That's good. I'm going to turn my attention to the mics because we have a few people lined up here. Um, can I get a, a question from uh, this woman in the blue over here? Hi, my name is Joy Andrews and I work at the University of Victoria. And thank you all for coming and sharing with us today. I've found it both practical and inspirational. So um, Justice Sinclair and Bob, you each raised something that went together in my head as a question. Um, the idea of making sure that Indigenous um, students, graduates, are represented in the workplace in a much more deep and uh, meaningful way, and the idea of Indigenous students feeling the need to work as social justice warriors. So I meet with Indigenous students, and I see the social justice warriors, and I wonder if you have any insights on how I can be helpful in bridging that gap so that maybe some of them will consider alternative careers and uh, become more represented in the workplace in general? Well, I, I think what I was saying is that, you know, uh, rather than trying to dissuade Indigenous kids, like that's a Band-Aid solution, trying to dissuade Indigenous kids from taking up those career paths. What I was trying to point out is that we as a society should make the transformational changes necessary so that Indigenous kids don't feel compelled to make that uh, thing, uh, make that decision in the first place, right? Yeah. So I mean, if you have young people at your doorstep who are it, wanting to go into law or wanting to go into politics, then you should encourage them and celebrate them and do all that you can to, to you know, make sure that they're successful. I think if you're trying to just like stick your finger, you know, in the dike and then um, hope that uh, the problem goes away, then the water's just gonna come over top of the levee eventually in, a, in another aspect. Meaning that if we just put a band-aid solution on that one problem as we may see it, then, you know, the societal uh, causes for that phenomena that you're witnessing in your office are gonna continue unabated and uh, will manifest themselves in other ways. So, I mean, talk to young people and encourage them to pursue their passions, right? Because being passionate about something is what is going to sustain you in the long run. But I wouldn't try to do too much social engineering in your office. Mm -hmm. 
Can I get a question from the mic over here? Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Johnston from Simon Fraser University, and I just have a question. With Canada being such a large recipient of immigrants, with this huge recent focus on refugees uh, coming to Canada, both peoples who have largely not formed part of Canadian history, but will most likely form a significant part of Canadian future, is there an opportunity here or a role for our Indigenous communities to help in the settlement of these new groups of Canadian who, um, who will form the new Canada that we're talking about? I think there's lots of uh, opportunity for relationships to be established early on and, and at the time of initial arrival and contact, they should be welcomed into the territory by the people of that territory. And that's been happening uh, as far as I've been able to witness that um, refugees, people who are coming into the country, newcomers who are arriving into the country uh, have been invited to participate in the welcoming of those people to that territory in a traditional way and I think that's good and that needs to be encouraged and room needs to be made for that. Uh, it isn't always part of the process and, and in particular it seems to have been highlighted simply for the refugees who are coming in lately. Uh, but I think it should be part of the process. If you look at our call to action um, that we, uh, in which we address this, one of the things in the text leading up to the call to action talked about the fact that Canada's population is changing and is going to change even more dramatically over the next 50 years so that probably within the next two or three generations or four generations, the uh, majority of people who will be living in this country will have not been born here or will be descended from people who have not been born here in, in, in this lifetime. And so that means that that's a whole generation of people who aren't even aware of this history. And, and that, that calls upon them to be educated about this upon their arrival, about residential schools we're talking about then, but about indigenous people generally upon their arrival, and we've recommended that the citizenship oath, for example, should be altered to reference the treaties, in addition to everything else that they are required to give an oath to, but that they recognize that they have an obligation to honor the treaties that have been entered into with indigenous people. And as newcomers, they are obligated to do that. They just don't know that, and they have never been told that, and so we're saying make them aware of it. Uh, but um, in terms of what the Indigenous community itself can do, I think that they should be stepping forward and making sure that they are present upon the arrival of newcomers. And one more question from this mic over here. Uh, good morning. I'm very honored to be here speaking with you and learning from you. Uh, my name is Captain Tammy Dietrich. I'm with the Canadian Armed Forces from CFB Edmonton. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts uh, on the Canadian Armed Forces Aboriginal programs, Bold Eagle, Raven, Black Bear, and what you see the impact of these programs having on the Indigenous communities of our country. You're assuming I know something about those programs. I, I made a huge assumption I have to there. admit I don't know a lot, okay. uh, so I can't really respond to it very well. I can tell you that um, uh, a number of Indigenous people, young people today and, and Indigenous people in the past, have chosen a military career as an option because it was one of the few areas where opportunities were, uh, were made available to them in order to be able to uh, engage in an activity that they were able to, that they were suited for. And so I think the military lifestyle has always been attractive to people in the indigenous community and likely will continue to be so. I have no idea what the numbers are these days, but um, the, um, the programs that you mention are not ones that I'm familiar enough with to be able to comment on, I'm afraid. I think, Does um, anyone else on the panel have any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, how I see those programs um, operating in the community is that, you know, particularly for Indigenous people who live in poverty, they're a way out of poverty. And so I think that that is a, a positive, you know, 
particularly for a young person who may not feel like university or college is uh, in their plans. It is a, a way to advance, uh, create a career after uh, high school, and that's what I've seen like anecdotally from people that I know. What I hear from people who are in the service is that you know there's attention paid on recruiting indigenous people, but about including indigenous culture into the culture of the force is something that it doesn't really happen in a very robust way, is what I've heard. So I know that you know some, some bases have a, a sweat lodge, but that's kind of seen as fairly exotic, and that um, you know the idea of uh, having uh, training, uh, not just for indigenous people, but for all members of the forces about indigenous people, cultures, is something that maybe uh, could be explored in the future and would help to make the, the culture of the force one that's more welcoming to indigenous people. So I think, um, you know, the young people that I know have joined the force either through Bold Eagle or just, I guess, through the normal entry. I don't know what that process is called, direct entry, I guess, maybe. Um, you know, they dealt with the same issues that other people um, would deal with, but then, you know, I think some of the issues around being separated from family and being separated from home were particularly acute. So I think uh, fostering an inclusive environment could help to alleviate those more acute, you know, senses of loneliness and isolation, mm -hmm. and then therefore make people more likely to be more successful uh, if they do choose to develop a career there in the forces. So I think that, you know, the paths in are positive, and then maybe it's the work on the inclusion within the environment that could uh, see more, more attention. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to thank everybody who's been brave enough to come up to the mics, but unfortunately we're going to have to, to close with some final comments. Um, but that I encourage you, if you did have a question, to take it home with you or to take advantage of the collective knowledge that exists in this, this room and in your communities and start to have those conversations. So as a closing comment, um, if I could get from uh, Justice Sinclair and from Wab, is a question from Twitter, which is, what gives you hope? And we'll end with that and pass it over to our wonderful MCs. Wab Canoe gives me hope. Uh, Murray Sinclair gives me hope. <laughs> All you're gonna get is a cliche, so. There you go. <laughs> this panel gives me hope. Thank you. Eh bien, merci infiniment à l'honorable juge Murray Sinclair, Wab Kinou, Jessica Bolduc et à l'aînée Annie Smith-Sinclair également. Merci infiniment. <applaudissements>